There are a lot of titles in wrestling. Too many, really. Yes, you could make a solid argument that there isn't a single major promotion out there today who doesn't have at least one belt which could be removed from the show. Whether it be the FTW title in AEW or the digital media title over in Impact, there's plenty of room to trim the fat. But as worthless as some of these appear at times, even they're not as low tier as the examples we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Paper Championships, Wrestling's Failed Titles. And as usual, if we're going to start anywhere, we should really start with a big example of a belt which never ended up living up to its name. But then, given the fact that it was largely confined to the mid-card after a while, how could the WWE's World Heavyweight title be anything less than a disappointment? Yes, the big gold belt, arguably the most iconic belt design in all of wrestling history, met with a sad end during the early 2010s. And that was because, after years of serving as Ric Flair's title over in both NWA and WCW, it eventually made its way over to WWE in 2002, where it would be rebranded as the World Heavyweight title. Why was this? Well, with the brand extension beginning and the WWE title being made exclusive to SmackDown, Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff decided he needed to create a new top prize for his show. So in September of that year, he awarded this to none other than Triple H, a move which allowed him to start his infamous reign of terror. But even if this was a period many fans look back on negatively now, at least the World Heavyweight title was a top belt. And it remained a top belt when it eventually moved over to SmackDown too, and was fought over by the likes of Edge, The Undertaker, and Batista. Come the start of the 2010s though, with the brand extension waning and the blue brand becoming more of a highlight show for Raw than anything else, the importance of their number one prize started to slip. And that was how we ended up in a situation where the likes of Jack Swagger and The Big Show were winning it, something which didn't do much to raise its prestige. No, quite the opposite in fact, because by the time we got to 2011, things had fallen so far that the Royal Rumble winner Alberto Del Rio challenged for it in the opener of WrestleMania 27. That's right, rather than main event like most Royal Rumble winners in the past, Del Rio's decision to go after what was by then considered such a secondary title meant he'd instead be booked to go on first. And as if that weren't bad enough, the very next year the same thing happened again when Sheamus curtain jerked against Daniel Bryan after he came out of the 30-man battle royal the winner. So perhaps it's a mercy that less than two years after this, the belt was unified with the WWE title and, as a result, removed from TV altogether. That said, at least the spirit of it does continue to live on to this day in the second world championship of modern day WWE TV, the Universal title. Of course, you can make an argument that having two world titles in your promotion at any given time is a bad idea as it dilutes the idea of there being one guy who's the best. But it's not just WWE who are guilty of this, because back in 1993, World Championship Wrestling muddied the waters of their own main event scene when they introduced the International Championship. What was this one about? Well, after formally seceding from the National Wrestling Alliance in July of that year, WCW were no longer able to gain access to the NWA's World Heavyweight title. So, realizing they needed to create their own top prize going forward then, they introduced the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship soon thereafter. And perhaps predictably, since he'd been the NWA champion prior, Ric Flair became the inaugural holder of the belt after defeating Barry Windham for the honor at that month's Beach Blast. The only problem with this, though, was that during those early months, the Nature Boy was still officially recognized as the NWA World's Champion as well, muddying the waters of the whole thing and confusing fans right when the new belt was trying to establish itself. And it wouldn't get much better from there, because when Flair left WCW altogether later that year after a backstage falling out with Jim Hurd, he'd take the big gold belt to WWF with him, where he claimed to still be the real World's Champion. So with Heard no longer having access to the physical title on account of a legal technicality, and no longer having access to the man holding it either, it meant he had to scramble to crown a new one when Rick Rude won it at September 19th's Fall Brawl. Yes, it was a complete mess, and while things would start to stabilize after this, by now the damage had been done. So that was why, come the summer of 1994, when Ric Flair returned to the company with the big gold belt in tow, He'd face off against then international champion Sting to unify the two, with the failed strap from there mercifully disappearing altogether. Of course, a failed belt isn't always a world title though. No, sometimes it's a mid-card one which ends up not catching on for whatever reason. And if you want any evidence of this happening, you only have to look to how, even during the most popular period of the industry's history, the WWF European title still failed to make much of an impact. 
Sure, there were some fun moments associated with it, such as D'Lo Brown and Al Snow's reigns, where they pretended to be from a different European country every week. But overall, this one never really felt important, as during the heights of the Attitude Era, WWF already had a firmly established secondary belt. After all, the Intercontinental title had a lineage which stretched back for decades, with it being held by some of the all-time greats, such as Macho Man Randy Savage and Bret Hitman Hart. So by comparison, the European strap, which had only been introduced in February of 1997, couldn't help but feel third tier by comparison. And it certainly didn't help that so much of its early history was tied up with Shawn Michaels, as during his infamous 82-day reign as champ, he treated it like a complete joke, something which wasn't even worth losing in a real match. Needless to say then, from there on, it was a belt usually reserved for the undercard, with the likes of Crash Holly, Perry Saturn, and the Hurricane being amongst the most notable holders of it. Could it have been more? Maybe. But then if truth be told, it was probably always one belt too many. And that's why, when it was finally unified with the Intercontinental title in July of 2002, few people cared to see it go. But for as pointless as the European title often felt over in WWF, even it can't compare to a belt WCW had introduced around the same time. And that's because there, as the company was failing spectacularly, the hardcore title was mirroring this. Yes, this one was a direct attempt to capitalize on the popularity of what New York were doing with their own version of the same belt at that point. But while over in WWF it was usually a lot of fun to see the likes of Crash Holly defend things under 24-7 rules, in WCW the same could not be said. No, rather than come up with interesting ideas for how and where folks might challenge the belt each week, Atlanta's version of the hardcore title ended up just being fought over in generic brawls. And given how many of these were on TV at the time between WWF, WCW, and ECW, it meant the whole thing quickly got boring to watch. Of course, it also didn't help that most of the people fighting over it were complete jobbers with no prior experience in hardcore wrestling. Seriously, amongst the most notable champions were the likes of Norman Smiley, Big Vito, Crowbar, and even Eric Bischoff at one point. Sure, occasionally a real star such as Terry Funk got a shot with it, but even that wasn't enough to make it feel in any way important. And this was especially true in 2000 because with the company having far bigger problems to worry about, it meant less focus than ever was paid to the division and its top prize. So thankfully, once Meng won it in January of 2001, then promptly left to go join the WWF, the belt was formally deactivated. And while we can only assume the reason for this was no one had the balls to take the physical belt back from him, at least it meant that we'd never have to see it on screen anymore. But it's not as if there weren't more failed mid-card belts still to come in WCW, as just a couple of months later in March of 2001, they'd introduce a new idea designed to recover some fans in the form of the Cruiserweight Tag Team titles. Forgot these even existed? Well, we wouldn't be surprised if you did, because they only lasted for eight days. That's right, just over a week after Elix Skipper and Kid Romeo defeated the Filthy Animals to become the inaugural holders at March 18th's Greed pay-per-view, Vince McMahon held a now-famous simulcast segment on both that week's Raw and Nitro, where he'd announced that he'd purchase the competition. And with him having no need for Cruiserweight Tag Team titles going forward then, it meant they'd never make it to WWF television. No, instead they'd been confined to getting boxed up somewhere at Titan Towers, hidden away like the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark. But could they have worked had they been given a chance? Maybe. But then by that point, the once mighty cruiserweight division of WCW had been so well and truly gutted that we are not convinced it was deep enough to maintain a tag division as well. Sure, the second and final holders of the titles were Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman, so there was still some degree of star power there. That said, without the likes of Chris Jericho, Eddie Guerrero, or Dean Malenko available to anchor things, there really just wasn't enough meat on the bone anymore. So, had the company continued, it's likely the belts would have just slipped into irrelevance soon enough anyway, eventually being remembered as nothing more than a footnote. But it wouldn't be the only time tag team titles ended up feeling worthless on account of the division around them not being deep enough, because despite a promising start in 2019, the WWE women's tag team titles have since become among the most worthless straps in the whole company. How did this happen? Well, Vince McMahon and more recently Triple H just haven't created enough duos to fight over them. Of course, tag team wrestling has almost always been a weak point in New York though, as with the boss seemingly not liking it all that much, outside of a couple of notable periods, it may as well have not existed at all.
That said, people still had hopes for the women's version of the belts when they were introduced at the end of the 2010s. And the reason for this was because, with the company really pushing women's wrestling at that point, and them being a pet project of inaugural champs Sasha Banks and Bayley, it felt like they might actually succeed. So perhaps that was why, at least initially, they did find some traction. Though, to be fair, this was largely on the back of the boss and hug connection, as with them being two legitimate main eventers, it gave the whole endeavor a sense of importance. Hell, even when 2020 came around and shows were being held in front of empty arenas, Banks and Bailey were able to give the fledgling belts some sense of importance by tying them into their excellent program. Unfortunately, though, this would mark the high point for women's tag team wrestling in WWE, because as time went on and it became apparent that there was a lack of other real challengers, it was left to makeshift pairs such as Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross or Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler to pick up the slack once the boss and hug connection went their separate ways. And from there then, the situation only continued to get worse with each new passing month, with it now getting to a point where the division is pretty much made up of one team in damage control and whoever their randomly paired together challengers are that week. In fact, as it stands right now, as of the time of this video's recording, one of the champions isn't even a regular roster member, with Lita's reign alongside Becky Lynch marking her first time holding a belt in WWE since 2006. And with it feeling unlikely she'll be around for the long term, it just means they'll probably be dropping the belts right back to Dakota Kai and Io Sky before long. That said, things can still be salvaged here if Triple H decides to start building a proper tag division for the women. And it's not as if he hasn't done such a thing before either, because back in 2016, when he spearheaded the birth of NXT UK, he was able to create something special with their world title, at least for a little while anyway, before things went south. Yes, the WWE United Kingdom title may be one destined to go forgotten now, but back in the 2010s, there was a lot of buzz surrounding its debut. And this was because, with some of the top stars of the British and European indie scene fighting over it, it truly felt like one to watch. The problem though, as we all soon learned, was that for as well booked as it was during the reigns of Tyler Bate, Pete Dunne, and Walter, no one had the time or energy to watch another hour of WWE TV every week, especially when it featured performers who, well great, didn't have any of the star power associated with the main roster or even NXT proper. And that meant NXT UK quickly became the least important of all of WWE's brands, even more so than 205 Live, with this having the knock-on effect of making their world title pretty much valueless as well. Sure, those few who were tuning in would be treated to some of the best matches under Vince McMahon's banner, such as Dunn vs. Bate at TakeOver Chicago, or the utterly savage Walter vs. Ilya Dragunov encounter on the October 29th episode of NXT UK. But for the majority, these bouts went past without much fanfare, as it felt like the only people watching were the most hardcore of the hardcore. So realizing there was no saving things at this point, WWE decided to cut bait on the British wing of their developmental brand, when at September 4th, 2022's Worlds Collide show, the NXT United Kingdom Championship was unified with the NXT World Championship when Tyler Bate lost to Braun Breaker. After that, NXT UK would be cancelled outright, as any top prospects it had such as Walter, Blair Davenport, or Mustache Mountain were all segued over to America full-time. And with the status of the planned NXT Europe currently being up in the air, it remains unclear as to whether a separate show will ever happen across the Atlantic again. But even if it doesn't, at the very least, the NXT UK title can say it was held by some of the best wrestlers out there while it lasted, the same of which can't be said for our next subject, and that's the WWF Light Heavyweight title. Yes, while the European title might have struggled to find an identity during the Attitude Era, that's nothing compared to the difficulties the light heavyweight belt had. Why was this? Well, WWF didn't really have a light heavyweight division. Seriously, if you go back and look up all the great cruiserweights of that era, they're pretty much all either working in Japan or Mexico, or have been signed to WCW. So with little left to work with then, Vince McMahon was forced to build the division around guys like Brian Christopher and Scott Putzke, two performers who most certainly weren't on the smaller side in terms of their physiques. But that wasn't the only problem here because with the boss always being a body guy first, it meant he'd never really taken to the higher paced style of cruiserweight wrestling. So even when he got performers such as Taka Michinoku, Tajiri, and S.A. Rios involved, he rarely allowed them to play to their strengths, instead having them work in the in-house WWF style. 
and this took any sense of originality or excitement away from the division, meaning that by 2000, while WCW's Cruiserweight title was still one of its highlights, the WWF equivalent was an afterthought at best. So that was why, come March of 2002, the belt would be formally retired when the champion X-Pac suffered an injury. That's right, it was of such little importance by now that it wasn't even worthy of being vacated. But even if Vince McMahon had to accept failure here, it wouldn't be the last time he'd try the idea out, because years later in 2016, both he and Triple H revived the style under the WWE banner with the WWE Cruiserweight title. And yes, we know there was another Cruiserweight belt over on SmackDown up until 2007, but while that one was a flop in its own right, it never flopped quite as bad as this rebooted version. But part of the reason for this was because his hopes were so high for it when it was first reintroduced on account of the excellent Cruiserweight Classic tournament held to determine the new champion. Yes, in a knockout competition which featured the likes of Zack Sabre Jr., Kota Ibushi, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa, some of the best high-flying matches WWE audiences had seen in years took place. And so when TJ Perkins eventually came out the winner and the new Cruiserweight champion as a result, it was expected that a whole new era was dawning on the main roster. Except that would never really happen because while the Cruiserweights would get time on Raw, they were rarely given any focus. No, instead they'd largely be sequestered away on their own show, 205 Live, a show so insignificant it could have featured Kenny Omega vs. Will Ospreay and people probably still wouldn't have bothered watching. But that wouldn't be the worst of it as it happened, because rather than keep running with the visually spectacular Neville as the face of the division once he won the belt in 2017, the company instead decided to shift focus over to Enzo Amore, with this contributing towards Neville quitting WWE outright. And after that, it only got worse still as come late 2019, the belt was removed from main roster WWE TV altogether. That's right, after three years of making little to no impact, the WWE Cruiserweight title was rebranded as the NXT Cruiserweight title, which was exactly where it remained up until the point it was unified with the North American title in January of 2022. So we think we can safely say that as long as Vince McMahon has a seat at the table, maybe this one shouldn't be tried again as seeing it fail for a third time would likely be the final nail in the coffin. Of course, it's not the only belt under the WWE banner which failed for a second time after being revived, however. No, to look at an even bigger example of this, we have to turn to our next subject, and that's the time Extreme Championship Wrestling was brought back as WWE CW. Yes, this one did not go well. But then that came as a surprise to no one, as trying to keep the spirit of the Outlaw promotion alive while the boss was booking, it just wasn't going to happen. And nowhere was this reflected more than in the booking of the ECW World Heavyweight Championship during this time. Because while in years prior it had been held proudly by the likes of Taz, Raven, and Tommy Dreamer, now it was very anti-extreme figures such as Bobby Lashley and The Big Show who had it around their waists. Hell, at one point in 2007, even Vince McMahon himself won the belt, something which no doubt caused a mass wave of fury to blow through the streets of Philadelphia as the citizens there prayed the brand would be put out of its misery once and for all. But for as much as they might have wanted this, there was no end in sight quite yet as WWE CW continued to limp on for another three years after that. And while this period would see folks such as CM Punk attempt to bring some sense of legitimacy back to the proceedings, it was clear there was no saving it in the end, and so, after Ezekiel Jackson won the belt in February 2010, the title and the brand itself were discontinued. Yes, it was a fitting finale in a way to have a forgotten mid-carder be the last man to hold the once prized possession as, given how much it had been butchered in WWE, its original spirit was already long dead anyway. Thankfully though, it seems WWE learned their lesson from this because NXT, the show which in many ways acted as the spiritual successor to WWE CW, has remained fairly strong in terms of how it's booked its top titles over the years. That said, with there being so many belts across the world of wrestling, we're sure there'll always be plenty more failed titles.